Good afternoon. My name is Brian Boyles. I'm executive director of Mass Humanities and so glad to see all of you here today for the latest installment of In Residence, our series of conversations with Mass Humanities. Uh, some quick housekeeping. Uh, we're going to talk today with our guests for around 45 minutes, after which uh, we'll ask your, ask your questions and you can drop those questions into the chat on Zoom and I'll read them uh, to our guests and hopefully uh, hear from all of you about um, what I think will be a really interesting conversation. As we've been putting these together, I've looked for people in the field of the humanities who I think have done incredible work, um, people I enjoy talking with, um, but also people uh, whose perspectives I believe are really important as we think about what the humanities mean in public life, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country. Our guest today is Stuart Rockoff. He is the executive director of the Mississippi Humanities Council. Uh, he's a native Texan, a PhD from UT Austin in history, who went on and worked for 11 years at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life in Jackson, Mississippi. He joined the Mississippi Council in 2013. We have known each other uh, since then, and I've always had a good time hearing from him. So I want to welcome you today, Stuart. Thanks, Brian. It's good to talk to you. We've been uh, kicking off some of these conversations um, in a place that I think is important when we think about the humanities and what they mean to our personal lives. A lot of times uh, in defining the humanities, I think we overlook the simple things that originally uh, pulled us into this line of work or into um, really the life of the mind. For you, um, can you think of, you know, earlier in your life, a book, a place, some other inspiration that you feel led you down this path um, to really making the humanities central in, in not just in your professional, but in your personal life? Sure, sure. Um, you know, I'm a historian by training. And I think back to in high school when I took AP history and in our textbook, it was a little, every chapter or so, a little sort of block text that said, where historians disagree. It shook me because if history to that point in my mind was a list of dates and places and people, the idea that history was actually a uh, conversation, it was a debate, that wasn't just what happened, but why it happened and why it was important. And so while I had to, for my tests in that class, kind of, kind of remember all the different interpretations of the New Deal from different historians, it really got me thinking that history was something that was very interesting to me, uh, very exciting. And so for me, so I grew up in Houston, Texas, which we can debate whether that's the South or not. Um, anyway, that's a different conversation. But I went to college up East um, at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. And there was something about being in New England that made my Southerness kind of come out or sort of blossom. And so I, I uh, became a diehard fan of William Faulkner, read you know, all of his classic novels up there in Connecticut, seeing myself as this, um, as, you know, as this Southerner, um, you know, outside, um, you know, of his home, which is a bit sort of ironic because at that point, I don't think I've ever been in Mississippi sort of at that time, yet I still sort of identify with it. So those, to me, thinking about those touchstones, one, that beginning of getting me into history as a profession and as a mindset, and then that Southern identity, which really came out. And then I did a lot of work in Southern, Southern history, or as much as you could at a New England liberal arts college. Um, but it was the experience of leaving the South that really got me thinking deeply um, sort of about what the South was and what it is and sort of my role within it. That's really interesting. As you know, I, I left the South uh, two years ago. And yeah. one of the reasons I, I, I'm always interested in talking to you is I continue to feel that distance and certainly feel how a Northern perspective on the South has um, a lot of problematic qualities. Yeah. I can remember that, um, and I don't know if you remember this, the first time you and I met was actually at the 2013 Humanities Conference in Birmingham, Alabama. Birmingham. You had Literally, just... Brian, that was my third day on the job. I remember that. And, and now that I've done that job for a little while, I know yeah. that the third day is a tough one uh, to enter a conference environment with. But it, it was that same conference uh, that uh, I thought they did an excellent job, the Alabama Humanities uh, yeah. Council giving us a we took a bus tour uh we went from birmingham we also visited montgomery and we stopped in selma as well and we yeah. walked across the pettus bridge and i remember and this was at the time for me from a southern perspective sort of feeling um the shock i think of some of the people who were very much from without the south who were on that bus particularly as we entered selma 
to realize that there was a, a very, very different uh, geography. You know, that segregation was something that was very visible um, to someone. Still, who, still uh, you mean. It really felt that way, yeah. And, and, and I think the unique poverty that exists right. yeah, like Selma is something that we shouldn't lose sight of. But as I move farther and farther away from the South, I'm more and more remarked that understanding history in the South is so much different because you're seeing, I think, and you're, and you're, you're always sort of thinking through what that narrative is, you know, that that change, and you think about the outside perspective too, for all kinds of different reasons. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, um, I can say that history is contested down here. History is complicated down here. And, you know, a part of what I do, especially when I interact with my colleagues from other councils around the country, is, is to try to explain a place like Mississippi. Uh, not unlike what Quentin Compson had to do um, when he was at Harvard um, um, in the novels of Faulkner. But anyway, um, but it's, it's, you know, to me, there is sort of this mystique about the South and especially about Mississippi. So if earlier I said, is Houston the South? Is Florida the South? Um, that's all debatable. It's not debatable, Mississippi is the South. And so there is this mystique here that I think kind of cuts both ways. There's this magical Mississippi that produces this font of creativity, William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Richard Wright, blues music, um, you know, all of this sort of, and I kind of call it sort of derisively as kind of the magic mud theory. Like there's something in the water, there's something magical in the dirt in the Mississippi Delta that produced all this amazing art. When in fact the truth is, and I, I'm a historian, not like it emerged from a socioeconomic context that was essentially oppression and white supremacy, right? Blues music can't be understood uh, without understanding sharecropping um, and white supremacy. And so uh, that's one mystique is that there's this sort of magical quality to it. And then the other side is that Mississippi is this dark, awful place that has an awful history, which of course is true in terms of its history. But it's easy to uh, miss some of the details. So let me give you an example. There's been a lot of um, uh, recent attention uh, given to the Emmett Till case. It's you know, a really, really seminal event in the history um, of the civil rights movement. I think a lot of people, especially in the aftermath of the George Floyd murder, are seeing some parallels. Um, but uh, there, there, there's a group in the Mississippi Delta that has been trying to preserve the legacy of Emmett Till, put up historic markers. And there have been several occasions where those markers have been damaged. People have fired guns in them, they've torn them down. Um, and that usually makes the Washington Post and the national media, and it's awful. But what oftentimes is missed is what's been going on in communities like Sumner, where white and black folks have come together to try to wrestle with that legacy. And there's been some amazing work on the ground. And so the other part of that mystique is this focus on the dark side that misses this incredible history of resilience and resistance um, and strength. Um, and you can see that going back to, you know, enslavement days, but certainly up through post-Civil War um, and the strong African-American communities that were established here that a lot of times those narratives have not been part of the generally accepted narratives. That's why history is contested. Um, but as I like to explain to people not from here, you know, this is a complicated place. And um, there's, there is a level of that complication that I think sometimes um, is omitted uh, when it's looked at by outsiders. I think what's really interesting now, um, a couple of things, you know, one, uh, when you think about that literary tradition where it's reached to this point, you have Jesmyn Ward, you have TZ Lehman, you have African Americans who are pushing not just the content, but the form of literature right now, but very much rooted in Mississippi and the conditions that you're talking about. And I think yeah. um, that can't just be an experience we have through the New York Times book review. We really need to think about what yeah. those words are and those complications that you talk about. Well, certainly Jesmyn and Kiese are great examples of that. Um, and they're interesting examples because, you know, what they write about is their experience essentially growing up in Mississippi and the difficulties of growing up as an African-American in Mississippi. Um, and yet they are our most, and also Angie Thomas, I would add to that list. Um, she is a YA author who wrote The Hate You Give and other novels that, again, talk about 
Black Lives Matter and race issues that may not be said in Mississippi, but she lives here and is from here and it shaped her. And so I think that, again, you can't understand the work of a Jesmine Ward without understanding her experience growing up African American in Mississippi, but frankly, in America. And, and what's interesting about them is that because they've received, all three of them, Angie Thomas, uh, Jesmine Ward, uh, Maso Kiese, and also um, um, I would also add Natasha Trethewey, um, who spent her childhood here, that because they've received such national recognition and because we take, we meaning Mississippi, take such pride in their achievements, that they have an opportunity to say things that might get through to people here, and I mean white people here, and so they have a freedom in a sense, um, uh, you know, a willingness for folks to listen to them because they're from here, um, they're still rooted here in sort of significant ways. You know, Mississippians across the political, uh, across the political um, spectrum bristle at outside criticism, you know, um, we're a bit more willing to listen to inside criticism. I think that's interesting because <clears throat> for me, it seems that the work is even more relevant to today's America, given the fact that more and more of America cannot excuse itself so easily from the things in which it accuses Mississippi of structural racism right. uh, around public health and not to go through a litany there. But I do think it's important and, and maybe increases the relevance of their work because if you do, you know, if you read Jesmond's work, that work is set in the present, you know, in a recognized present that is unique to Mississippi, but not just to Mississippi. There are places around the country that don't look that much different, even for white folks, um, right. than some of the places she describes, without, I think, losing that specificity. Yeah. When you arrived in Mississippi, um, and to take your, to your first job there at, at the Jewish Life Center, can you talk a little bit about, and, and I think this probably continues in your work today, the way that you wanted to approach navigating those complications, you know, and embracing that history, but also making it a place where many different people are able to come to the table, um, whether that's organically or through programmatic approaches that you've made. Yeah. Um, kind of a couple points that made you think of that. One, you know, I was a historian of Jews in the South, and that inherently complicates accepted Southern narratives, right? So where do Jews, where do Jewish immigrants fit into the narrative of Southern history, how do they navigate the race relations? And so, you know, from the beginning of my academic career, those are the questions I was interested in. Is, you know, where are, the, where, where are the boundaries of whiteness and how do groups kind of fit in between those? But, you know, um, you know, so I, but a lot of my work at the Institute of Southern Jewish Life was focusing on uh, looking at sort of the stories of Southern Jewish communities. And what was remarkable, Brian, was that so many of those stories were very similar, you know, Jews move into a town. It was essentially a story of acceptance. There were certainly examples of the opposite, um, of anti-Semitism, um, but by and large, Jews integrated well within their communities. And so part, was interesting is that a big chunk of my job, not a big chunk, but a part of my job was speaking to Northern Jewish groups. They would either come down or would bring me up to speak. So I spoke in New Jersey and California and Florida um, and New York to explain the exotic character of the Southern Jew to them, right? And so partly it was trying to explain the complexity of the South to people outside. So just the, the kind of classic example is the role of Southern Jews in the civil rights movement, right? Um, within the American Jewish history and American Jewish identity, the idea of Jewish support for civil rights is sort of core. There was a, a, a documentary series on PBS about a decade ago where I think an entire hour of like a five-hour series was dedicated to the civil rights movement, um, um, or maybe one out of six. Anyway, um, but the story of Southern Jews and the civil rights movement is a lot more complicated than, than it is for Jews in a place like New York. Um, you know, it's an insider narrative versus an outsider narrative. It was the pressures that were brought to bear. And frankly, it's an example of racial assimilation of Jews living in a place um, and, and um, ex um, accepting the ideology um, um, of that place. So a lot of it was trying to explain to them that yes, Jews were not protesting with SNCC, you know, at lunch counters in the South, but here is how they 
but here's how they resisted and here's how they accommodated that status quo. So in my old job, it was, again, part of it was explaining that complexity to outsiders. Um, and so that has certainly continued in my you know, current position here at the council. We had a conversation the other day um, around um, Mississippi and Massachusetts and thinking yeah. of the civil rights movement, but specifically as, as today people debate allyship and what role um, white folks play in a civil rights movement, either today or then. Right. Give me some thoughts for you, I think, on what that relationship specifically is and, and what the maybe the takeaways or the insights from a Mississippi perspective on the role of those white allies in the civil rights uh, movement uh, was. Yeah, um, this should be a drinking game where each time I say the word complicated, folks should drink. Um, it's complicated. So like, for example, going back to the Jewish story. So um, Jews take tremendous pride that so many of the white college students who came down for Freedom Summer were Jewish. When you talk to African-American folks down here, they saw them as whites. You know, they didn't see them as sort of that different. And I think that the role of the outside, um, either with Freedom Rise, but certainly with Freedom Summer, um, that the narrative has been very much centered on the voices of those Northern volunteers. And I think that, you know, the, the, the trope of white savior narrative, allyship, things, you know, you know sort of complicate that. I mean, um, you know, there has been a bit of a correction and there's been a real emphasis in the scholarship on the role of local people. Um, I think that's one reason why Fannie Lou Hamer has been lifted up so much, um, at least down here, is that she was an authentic, local, uh, former sharecropper, really, really important civil rights leader, you know, and whereas someone in a great Massachusetts and, and a great Mississippian, Bob Moses, who I used to fly on, um, on uh, airplanes with back, back when he was teaching algebra at a high school here in Jackson, he'd fly back from Boston every um, every Friday night, I mean, every Sunday night, um, you know, that, 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 um, and I think that was the ideology that, that certainly Mr. Moses would talk about is the importance of AMZ Moore, the importance of E.W. Steptoe, those local people in Mississippi that often haven't gotten the attention, um, that, uh, that they were crucial for that. So, so for us, I think there is a great appreciation for those outsiders who came down. Um, but I think there's also a recognition of that we need to really honor those local people who were uh, played a long role over a long period of time sort of in these movements. The role that humanities councils play, I think, is often to bring those local people back to prominence or to support right. communities. Or trying tell to tell those local stories for sure. yeah and and to have that as a mission is a great thing and we are one of 55 uh, two of 55 i guess humanities councils around yep. the yep. country uh every year the federation awards the schwartz prize um for excellence in the humanities to a council in 2018 yeah. the mississippi council you received the schwartz prize uh for your racial equity grant program can yeah. you talk a little bit about that yeah sure uh it was the first time we even applied for the schwartz prize um we had gotten, we, um, again, that idea of telling those important local stories um, in regards to civil rights, in regards to resistance to racism, that that, we thought that was um, a very, very important part of the council's work going back to our founding in 1972. But we really thought that we, if we could, we, we were able, with some outside support, create a dedicated grant program um, and hire someone whose job it was to reach out to community groups, community organizations, to encourage them to let us help them tell their own stories. Um, so just to give you one example, there is a town called Grenada, Mississippi, that had a very violent resistance to school integration. Um, it was court-ordered school integration. There, um, there was uh, a, a pretty violent white resistance to that. Um, not very widely known nationally, not very widely known in the state, but that history was one that still carried a lot of trauma in the black community in Grenada. And it was a story that had been kind of kept quiet. There were no official markers. There were, and so we helped to fund some programs where people got together and told 
told their story, told their experience of what it was like to try to go to a school as a young girl and have a white mob violently attack you. Um, and, and, you know, the ultimate goal of that program was to try to build bridges. Some programs were more successful than others uh, in terms of reaching, um, um, you know, white audiences, essentially. Um, but I think the power of that program was that it wasn't centrally controlled. You know, we offered money um, and encouraged groups to do what would fit in their own communities. And we, we were trying to drive conversations about the history of racism in those communities. So, you know, earlier we talked about, you know, Mississippi can't hide from its history, right? I mean, you know, debating whether white supremacy still has an impact on life today is sort of a short argument here in Mississippi because it's sort of all around us. Um, and so because we can't hide from it, you know, our thought was that, you know, let's try to drive this conversation. Let's try to address these, these wounds that exist in many of these communities. And, you know, I'd say we, you know, like any grant program, in some cases we were quite successful and others we were less so. But um, I think that just knowing that we were there helping to, to, to um, foster that conversation is something that I was really excited about and I was pleased to get that national recognition. You mentioned building bridges. What's mm -hmm. it look like for you when it, when it, when it, when a, when a successful grant happens and a community does that? What comes to mind? People thinking about things that they hadn't thought about before. People, you know, like we had um, we had one program. It was on all of its service. It was a failure. It was a small crowd. It was a discussion about what makes you proud to be an American. And we didn't really draw many people, but we broke up into small groups. And I was part of a conversation with people who were from widely different political perspectives, having real conversations and having one of those, you know, the people walking away from that, like understanding a different perspective in a much deeper way. So that probably affected, you know, or maybe 15 people in the room, Brian. Um, but I think back as that as a great example, you know, um, rather than drawing 400 people to an auditorium who sit, listen, and then leave. So, so you know, to me, that's, that's the bridge building is, is thinking about, you know, uh, people looking at things from different perspectives. And it's so important here. And this is one of my, I wouldn't call it pet pee, but pet issues, is that for much of my state's history, um, much of the African-American experience has been ignored. So Mississippi is a unique state. We have the largest percentage of African-Americans in our population of any state in the country, about 38%. Um, and through the 1930s, our state was black majority, which means that when all of the Confederate monuments were built for the most part in counties, when our now old state flag was adopted in 1894, a majority of our population were African-American. They had been disenfranchised and were disempowered. And so, and so that point is trying to get people to think of Mississippi as not just white Mississippi. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is there's a historian uh, named Dennis Mitchell who actually wrote a book called A New History of Mississippi. And, he, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, at the end of the Civil War, most Mississippians were excited about the Union victory. People were like, what? Mississippians? Pro-Union? What are you talking about? He's like, most Mississippians were enslaved at the time of the Civil War. So when you factor that perspective in, it changes how you see the world. It changes how you see history. It changes how you see what stories are put in granite and put in public places and which stories are forgotten. And so, and I forgot your original question, I've been sort of rambling, but the point is that that's been a key part of what the council has always done and I, has been really, really sort of important to me. Yeah. I love the idea of that, that, that core fact being a window into a conversation that no matter what- It's like what, a lens that changes change. how you see everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, it sort of really does and it, it, um, yeah, so, so that's kind of, those are the sorts of programs in terms of building a bridge, Brian, that's, that's the question. Um, that's what we sort of aim for. And, you know, um, I know that we're gonna talk a little bit about our state flag, 
But to me, um, uh, uh, a few months ago, end of June, I think, um, our state legislature voted to take down our state flag. Our state flag, for those who don't know, had a Confederate insignia in its top left corner. It was the last state to have the Confederate flag essentially in its flag. It was a very, very sort of divisive issue. Um, and we can talk about how it happened, why it happened. But um, I think a key point was that bridge, right? It was people, in particular white legislators, began or really looked at the issue from the perspective of their African American colleagues. And I think that was key. It wasn't the only key, but it was part of that decision. So that's how I see a bridge building sort of occurring. So tell me what it was like when that decision was made for, when, I think as the head of the council and just as a resident of Mississippi, yeah. what did it feel like when that happened? It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. You know, this is an issue that had been going on for a very, very long time. Um, I moved to Mississippi in 2002, which is important to note because it was a year after 2001. In 2001, there was a statewide referendum on whether to change the flag. And I missed that, which I think was probably a good thing. It was extremely divisive, extremely ugly. They, have, uh, they held public forums all around the state during that sort of campaign. And I seen some of the footage from those, from those programs and they're just awful. I mean, ugly, divisive. I mean, it's hard to feel like anything good came out of them. But, you know, um, I think a key turning point certainly was 2015 um, with the killings um, I'm in Charleston um, I'm at the church. And there was a sense that we really need to reassess this iconography of the Confederacy. And so, you know, the Humanities Council feels like, you know, we don't take political positions, um, but we can foster conversations and foster factual conversations. So we had just started a program called Ideas on Tap, which was kind of a community dialogue program, you know, kind of, you know, sort of discussing important issues. And after a few successful programs, I thought, you know what, let's do the state flag. And, you know, I think if I had been there in 2001, I wouldn't have had the guts to do it. I think I would have been afraid. But perhaps it was naivete, but I felt like we could model how we can have a civil conversation about this very divisive symbol. There was no more hot button issue than our state flag, which seems kind of crazy. And the way we did it is we framed it not as a debate, not should we keep the flag, should we change it? But we framed it as what is this flag mean to you? What does it symbolize for you? And we had a panel that was very diverse. We had pro-flag people, we had anti-flag people, we had historians, we had both white and African-American. The audience was similarly diverse. And it was a little, people were a little nervous, uh, but it worked, it worked, you know? People listened to each other. And afterward, uh, people on different sides of the issue were talking and listening. And I don't know if we changed any minds, but I think we showed that this debate can happen. So we did a few more of those, and I don't want to give the impression that we helped lead the way for this. I mean, I definitely don't want to say that. But I think that what happened this year, certainly with the murder of George Floyd and the national um, Black, Lives La uh, Black Lives Matter movement and the national reckoning with these issues of race, which became reckoning with these symbols of the Confederacy that it brought the subject back in a strong way. And so all of the activists, folks in our Congressional Black Caucus who had long been pushing it uh, to no avail, they begin to uh, speak with their white Republican colleagues and they convince enough people and you had some interesting um, folks came to lobby. I mean, you know, a big day, down at the Capitol was our um, college football coaches all came down to the Capitol to lobby to change the state flag. You know, Lane Kiffin and Mike Leach, who had just arrived in the state because this is their first year coaching wow. the state, but they came to lobby and like that made the news. And, yeah, but also things like the business community and um, 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 also Mississippi Baptist Convention. So all these folks began to speak up and push in that direction and it happened. And what's amazing about it, Brian, is that we are in the midst of choosing a new state flag. In fact, just yesterday, our appointed commission came up with the two finalists um, 
that they're going to choose between, and then their selection will be voted on by the public in November, which is another topic of conversation. But what's exciting about it is that as people are talking about what should our flag look like, it's such a positive conversation. Now, granted, they're different aesthetics. Do you like this color or that? But it's like people are talking about the aspects of our state, of our history, of our topography that unify us, that connect us rather than what divide us. And so even through the process, and even if the flag is voted down because folks don't like the color or whatever, just the conversation that people are having about it is such an improvement. You know, as you mentioned, we, we are bound and determined and legally required not to take political stands. And Correct. whatever state I've lived in, I've tried to stick with that. What seems to be almost a, a hot button at this point is to actually embrace the complications. To actually, you know, there is, a, there is a complication here. And that isn't a moral judgment on anyone except to say that we have a shared humanity and we're bringing a lot of different perspectives to any of these yeah. issues. It seems like you can't get to the place that you're describing right now without starting there. Because if we start with sides, there's not a whole lot of negotiation that happens. And I think that complicating things is so much of a charge of what a public humanities um, program or a council does. Um, and sometimes it feels like that's a dwindling space. You know, the, 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 the desire to make it complicated, at least as a starting point, um, has, is almost becoming a radical position. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I thought a lot about what is our lane? You know, what is our role in this, you know, as an organization? And for us, you know, we were the organization that because of our past work with the Sons of Confederate Veterans, I was able to bring them in. They were part of that panel discussion we had. You know, I explained to them what we were trying to do, and they participated both on the panel and in the audience. And so, you know, being able to bring the different sides together and convene that conversation are, um, uh, to me, that's an important part of what we do. So, so when the debate was going on in the legislature, if you go through our social media feed, you won't see um, us endorsing the bill, but what you will see is us saying, well, here are some facts that you need to factor in. When the original flag was adopted, 58% of our state were African American. So we talk about this state represents our heritage. Who is our, you know? Who are you talking about? So that's where we kind of saw our role in that debate is to try to bring that kind of wider perspective. Um, but, you know, there, there were plenty of people um, on both sides that have, you know, pushing their way. But, but you're right. I mean, it, you know, it's hard for us to figure out sometimes where we belong. But I think it's that, you know, as a convener and making sure that that different perspective is brought in, right? So what is the popular popular legitimacy of a flag that's adopted when a majority of your population is disfranchised? That, those are the sorts of questions that we were trying to push as part of this debate. Right. We've got to ask the question, be the, the one that asks the questions, I think. Is yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. So now, uh, no matter where you live in this country or this world, we're facing a pandemic. And a lot of the things right. you and I have talked about have been related to bringing people together, um, audience size, whether it's 15 or, or 400, all of our past history is mostly in-person meetings. Yeah. How are you seeing um, your role and the work shift uh, to respond to this pandemic, given that, you know, it's not just getting audience, it's also, you know, a lot of what we inherently do is community building. It's that bridge building you're talk about, talking about. How to go about that in a time when we cannot actually share physical space. Yeah. Um, it's hard, man. You know, um, uh, uh, just this morning, I was meeting with all of the directors of our state library systems. Um, they were having their meeting and I spoke to them and it was over Zoom. You know, I was in my bedroom. And if this had been in person, I would have been able to meet them one to one, talk to them, figure out. And it, it felt there was much less of a connection. So for us, the challenge is, you're right, a big part of what we do as a council a big part of the humanities is about connection and building those connections between people. And, you know, it's harder to do virtually, but there are some things that make it, um, there are some benefits to doing a virtual. So for example, you know, um, uh, virtual helps to dissolve 
sort of geographic boundaries. You know, um, um, I noticed from the list of participants, there are folks from both Mississippi and Massachusetts and other states here. You know, if if you and I were talking in an auditorium, that wouldn't be the case. Um, so that's one, trying to figure out ways of fostering connections, harnessing the benefits of virtual programming, while also understanding that in some ways it is limited. And the other thing that we've kind of focused on is, you know, how do we help add context to this moment? How do we help people understand what's happening now? And that could be history, um, comparing it with the flu pandemics, you know, of a century ago. Uh, to where our next ideas on tap is looking at it philosophically. You know, what is, how do we balance individual freedom with notions of the common good? Because that's the issue of wearing a mask, right? You know, not wearing a mask, that's my personal freedom. This is still America. But then how do you weigh that with the common good? So we're trying to take the issues that we're all dealing with, but approach them from sort of a deeper, more humanities perspective. And, and like that is the humanist perspective is to understand yeah. it's almost the, the core problem here of my personal freedom versus the common good you know right. the millennial <laughs> millennium old uh, millennial uh, discussion and here we are having it um on new platforms and in ways that seem both very life or death and completely political at the same time right <laughs> yeah and it's i mean you know it's hard i mean for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work from home and to socially distance, um, you know, it is sort of profoundly isolating. Um, but, you know, um, so it's figuring out how we can overcome that. And, you know, I wish I'd say I found the solution, but I think we're all kind of working, kind of learning as we go along. And I think we're all trying to keep an eye on the folks who don't have that luxury, you know, right. which has always sure. been our desire to serve um, with the humanities. Yeah. Um, I want to remind folks to drop questions into the chat, um, but I think related to what we were just talking about, we do have, um, I think, a positive announcement thinking of all the different people from different mm -hmm. states around this chat, which is Mass Humanities and the Mississippi Humanities Council will be uh, starting a new series together where we'll be bringing uh, perspectives from both states, uh, hopefully through the eyes of, of scholars and people that we have funded um, to talk about um, difference, but also I think the places where there's commonality. So we've already tonight, today talked about the civil rights movement. Um, I think state flags is certainly Massachusetts where I think on the verge of having a real conversation about it here. Um, and climate change um, affects both of these close coastal states. Right. So in all this, I think whether we call it Mass Miss or Miss Mass or someone comes with a better name, we do have a meeting, I think, in another week or so to put our heads together and get this yeah. started. And like you said, without Zoom, you know, this is impossible. And, and for you, what, it, what would be a hope in putting these audiences in the same place, at least virtually? Yeah, well, a couple of things. You know, one, we originally had this conversation pre-COVID about how we could figure out how to do something that brings our people together. And how can we connect Massachusetts and Mississippi? And I'm a bit embarrassed that we never thought about a, a virtual Zoom. So <laughs> it's true. Sure. But we were going to move it. COVID, it was like, well, we duh, this is it. actually going to be kind of easy. In fact, we're kind of doing yeah. it now. So my yeah. hope yeah. is that, right yeah, so my hope is to, um, um, you know, again, sort of um, cut away from those mystiques I talked about. I mean, I mean, from our perspective as a Mississippian, breaking through those mystiques, um, helping to explain some of that complexity, and think about things, the ways in which we are connected. Um, you know, I think there is, in a lot of popular imagination, this sense of Mississippi as the other, as this, you know, separate, very, very different place from the rest of America, certainly very different from Massachusetts. But I think that by thinking about symbols, and narratives, things that go into flags or in monuments. I think that there are a lot of interesting parallels and, and, and ways that we can learn from each other and bringing different voices, you know? So, you know, bringing the scholars that you work with at Mass Humanities, uh, you know, involved in our programs and bringing the scholars here that we use a lot to kind of communicate with, um, with your audience. To me, that's a real exciting, um, exciting potential. Yeah, and I, I'd say just, from my perspective and someone who's fairly new to Massachusetts, what I've learned is how much more complicated it is as a place. You know, it is 
um, not simply uh, Yankee values uh, and, and, and a certain starchiness that when you're in the South you perceive, there are many, many different people and this is a very global place. So there are a lot of different voices, and yeah. I think, that are important. And as someone who's always appreciated Mississippi, I think putting these two yeah. things together is we're going to both learn a lot and I think the audiences will too. Yeah. And sort of documenting those narratives that are not widely known and yeah. kind of you know, making the kind of perceptions of our state from outsiders uh, more accurate and more, you know, and kind of more complex. I think that sounds really exciting. Right, because it, I think of if we have a parallel in coastal science, you know, those two places are not not looking at each other for lessons, right? They're not actually not studying the data from those places. They need no. to dynamics are. And as I said, when I when I even think back to what we were talking about with Jesmyn Ward, you know, nowhere in America can we ignore these narratives. You know, we can only benefit from comparing them, especially right now. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So questions, I have um, a first one from Dan Carmen, uh, who said he is, uh, he's entering the BU Master of Divinity program at Boston University, um, and is someone with a classics and film background. Um, who may go on uh, to a PhD. Any advice from either of us um, relating to um, complications in the humanities and public life? And I think, uh, I think Dan, I'm hearing you right that you want a little maybe career advice as far as how to pursue the interests that you have and reach, you know, a place where you're actually working in these complications. And I, I can say this, I was in a panel actually last year at our conference around the question of how do you how do you end up in some position to be able to have a conversation like this? And I do think, um, and I've been thinking about this a lot with Massachusetts and mass humanities, you know, there's both the scholarship and the knowledge and there's also the ability to, um, to build scaffolding, you know, to uh, at least metaphorically be able to plug in microphones, to be able to do all the work that's really necessary to make these kind of, these kind of conversations happen. Uh, certainly that's the path I took, um, and it's not the only one, but I do think it's always good to really understand that if you want to be part of a public humanity sphere, there's a well-roundedness that needs to be there, um, simply because of the complications we're talking about. There are many, many different people and scenarios to serve, and the more that your career, I think, tracks in that kind of diverse experience, you know, the better off, you, from my perspective, you end up. Yeah, you know, I would say... Be outwardly focused, connect with the public. You know, I was in graduate school, history PhD, and I was completely disconnected from anything but the books I was reading, my colleagues that I would, you know, eat lunch with and drink a beer with and talk about these issues. But I was an immigration historian and I never connected with immigrant organizations in a place that had lots of immigrants. You know, I was very academically focused. So, I, you know, I think that if you, when you're a graduate student, to begin to automatically cultivate that public orientation of connecting with public groups, um, so connecting with public history, with museums, um, that is a great way so that then when you're finished and you have to figure out what you're going to do to pay your rent or your mortgage or whatever, you've got that wealth of connections and that wealth of knowledge about what is available out there. I mean, I finished my PhD and other than applying for academic jobs, I had no clue, right? And I ended up in a public history job kind of by accident. But, but I think that, you know, that sense of connection and being turned outward um, is, I think, important. You know, a lot of the ways that I learn more about um, Massachusetts and even what's going on in academic circles is through the grants that come to us. Yeah. Uh, but I wonder for you, um, if you're hearing about new scholarship about Mississippi, if you're seeing work, what, what excites you about maybe what I think an, another generation study of the state is right now? Um, that's interesting. You know, um, it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of work going on within the state. And there's a lot of interesting work about Mississippi happening, you know, outside. So that whenever the National Endowment for the Humanities announce all their grants, I always read through them, no matter if they're from Mississippi or not because you see a lot of Mississippi topics in the Public Scholar Program. In fact, there is a new book out by a professor, is it from Williams? Somewhere in Massachusetts about William Faulkner, you know, and issues of race. And so, so, and that was an NEH funded Public Scholar Program. And so, you know, that sort of stuff I think is interesting. In civil rights history, it's certainly that kind of local people focus, which is, you know, not so much cutting edge, but still I think there, there's a lot of work to do. 
But for me, it's history that's not, that takes place aside from the civil war and civil rights, you know? There's a wealth of just incredibly important history and stories that have been kind of, you know, overlooked by, you know, because of our focus on these two sort of major periods and events. I'm particularly excited at some of those. Um, you know, we've been um, really interested in the work of Ida B. Wells. She's a Mississippi native, um, although she did most of her work um, in Memphis and then in the North, but there's been a kind of reclaiming of her here. Um, kind of a couple years ago, uh, we brought in Paula Giddings, who's her biographer, to come talk about her. And, and so, so, you know, helping to uh, celebrate those folks who were really significant historically, but had but were sort of marginalized both in her own time and in sort of history. So that's always been real exciting, uh, you know, for me. We were talking before we turned on the cameras about just trying to craft a budget in a difficult time. Um, <laughs> I'm asking you a question about your budget. Yeah. Back off to here. Um, but I think people have been waiting for fifty. Come on, <laughs> question covered. <laughs> people are the spreadsheet. They promise yeah. they talk yeah. about budgets. Sorry. Yeah, I know, I know. I'm waiting on my reports. Um, yeah. But for me, I think it, just the examples you just brought up, you know, while there's a lot of perils when you're thinking about budgets and resources yeah. right now for the type of work we do, there's also this feeling there's, there's wind at our back in that there is so much public interest in just the type of figures you're talking about, you know, yeah. and digging down into those histories and not just the Civil War history, but looking all the way and pulling the strings all the way to the present that you know, I feel like is, is why we do the work, right? Right. You know, it's interesting. Um, I've been on a few panels here about the crisis in the humanities, you know, and that usually looks like the sort of decline in history majors in college. It's the decline of English majors. But from my perspective, um, in, you know, in the public humanities, I see a tremendous interest in flourishing. So in Mississippi two years ago, we just built two incredible state history museums, a civil rights museum, and the Museum of Mississippi History that attracted huge amounts of both state support, private foundation support, even in COVID still attracts large audiences. We see tremendous interest in our literary heritage. There's a literary marker trail. And so, you know, our challenges are, you know, you know, I don't really see that crisis, you know? I mean, I see a tremendous amount of interest and especially now, because of the moment in which we're in and people are thinking about issues in ways they maybe haven't before. There's a great interest in this. You know, one um, sort of the reason I was on a Zoom call with all of our state public librarians is because we're launching a grant program to help them purchase books about the history of racism. Um, you know, and the idea being that there's great demand for these books and because their budgets have been crunched because of declining tax revenues, that we can help them meet this demand, right? And so again, that's responding to interest in the, you know, in the humanities. That's a great point. That's a great point. And a great program. Um, I feel like I'm, I may steal a few of your ideas. I stole it from Indiana. So like, be sure to- <laughs> Or I'll steal it from Indiana. Yeah. That's um, Well, I did learn a lot and I think I always do when we talk um, and like you, I, I really do feel like the field is actually in a really great place in many, many ways. Right. And we need to, um, we need to all acknowledge that and put our heads together to keep that going. Yeah. Well, Brian, this has been, this has been fun, you know, as we spend, you know, day to day dealing with things like budgets and emails and staff meetings and all, it's nice to kind of step back and think about the work that we're doing from a broader perspective. That, that certainly helps me. Um, you know, help to sort of understand what direction we're heading in and why we're doing it. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks for being with us. Uh, we do have uh, Mass Miss or Miss Mass, or if anyone on here has any ideas, please email me. We're going to come up with a great uh, name, but I think there's a lot of S's and M's involved, and there's a, um, there's a way to get it. I think Miss Mass, I don't know. Miss uh, Mass is good. I like it. Although my staff is not very much in favor of it, but we can have it during our meeting. 
Yeah. Well, that's why we'll bring all our staffs to the next meeting to really hear what the truth is. Brain power. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stuart. Um, thanks everybody for being with us today. Uh, we're taking a couple week pause and we'll be back with some more programming in in residence. Um, but in the meantime, you can follow us on social media at Mass Humanities on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Uh, I think we're posted in the chat um, all those same handles for the Mississippi Council. Thank Go you. To the website. Make sure you stay in touch. I think that as you've heard today, the work that's going on in Mississippi is not just important to the residents there. But it's important to us as a country, and those are the conversations we want to have um, in the coming year. We'll be sending all of you a YouTube link uh, to this conversation and appreciate everyone on here supporting the humanities in Massachusetts and in Mississippi today. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, Brian. Take care, everybody. Take care, Stuart.